Hi, Kim Eagle here for ACC.org. We're at ACC 22, and this is the third and final day of the meeting. It's been fabulous. Getting together face-to-face -face with colleagues and hearing science in person is just such a, a breath of fresh air for all of us. Today, we're gonna to talk about uh, the meeting highlights for this day, and I have with me today, Pyle Coley from Denver and Deepak Bhatt from Boston. I'm gonna start with a study called POISE, which is a very interesting study looking at uh, perioperative management. Pyle, take it away. Uh, thanks, Kim. I found this study very interesting because anecdotally, based on observational data, what I generally tend to do is tell my patients to hold their ACE inhibitors or ARBs prior to them having surgery. And we really don't know what our blood pressure targets should be, you know, preoperatively, intraoperatively, and postoperatively. So that's where the study, I feel like, really sheds a lot of light despite being a negative study on, on what we ought to be doing. So essentially they had two different strategies. One was a hypotension avoidance strategy and one was a hypertension avoidance strategy in non-cardiac patients who were undergoing surgery and had increased vascular risk. Now these are patients who are already hypertensive at baseline. So taking at least one antihypertensive medication. Um, in fact, 30% of them were on three or more antihypertensive medications and their ejection fraction has to be at least greater than 30%. And they randomized them to one of these two strategies. So the hypotension avoidance strategy was keeping your MAP above 80 intraoperatively and holding your meds preoperatively, especially the ACEs and the ARBs. Whereas the hypertension avoidance strategy was keeping your MAP above 60 and taking your meds as usual, including ACEs and ARBs preoperatively and initiating them soon postoperatively as well. And they looked at the composite outcome, a vascular outcome really, of vascular death, myocardial injury as measured by troponins, um, as well as stroke and cardiac arrest. And interestingly, and to my surprise, actually, they found no difference in the major vascular composite outcome. They found no difference in the endpoint of stroke, in atrial fibrillation. There was even no difference in the length of stay or the mortality at 30 days. So, you know, I was a little surprised to see these results because I always thought that under anesthesia, your, your auto regulation becomes impaired and where we maintain your MAP would be critically important in determining your outcomes. But really this was a negative study that shed a lot of light on the fact that we probably can continue ACEs and ARBs and we maybe don't have to be as strict about our MAP goals. Now, what I would have liked to see perhaps was more of the renal outcomes, which were not reported as well as some of the bleeding outcomes, which were also not reported. I, I agree with your analysis. I, I, was, I was thinking about this. I thought the avoid low blood pressure group would actually do better. Uh, but I'm also wondering is if you're in a trial and paying attention to blood pressure minute by minute, hour by hour, that probably matters because the number of patients who got really low or really high was probably reduced just by the attention in a clinical trial. Deepak, any thoughts? You know, it's interesting, Paul said that she's a believer in holding ACE and ARB. I'm a believer in giving them. And I think that shows why trials are necessary. Right? Everyone has strong feelings about perioperative medicine, but rarely are there data. And, and, and Kim, you've, of course, written about and led in this area of, of perioperative care for decades. But it, it is an area where, you know, it, it's often anecdote that rules the day. So to have a large, well-done trial, irrespective of the exact findings, I think is extremely useful. A famous politician once said, I have strong opinions that I don't always agree with. <laughs> and this is, a, this is an example of that, the perioperative management of blood pressure. Well, let's move on to another trial with a great name called Spiral. Uh, Deepak, take us away on this one. Yeah, absolutely. This is spiral hypertension on med. The, uh, some results have been uh, presented and published before. This is looking at the 36-month results. And uh, just to remind everyone, this is a sham control trial of renal artery denervation using radio frequency energy. And uh, the initial trial, six-month results were positive. Here is the, uh, again, three-year results. And Look pretty good. Um, you know, it looked like uh, there was a significant difference uh, in change in 24 hour systolic blood pressure between the two arms. You know, in the sham control arm, it went down by uh, about eight or nine uh, millimeters of mercury and about 18 or so uh, in the denervation arm, such that there was a difference uh, between the two, you know, that was significant. So uh, to me, that's, uh, I think, a really important. Uh, finding. It, it was about, if you look at that difference, about 10 millimeters of mercury. So it gets within that range, you know, where people say, okay, maybe that is actually clinically worthwhile. 
Uh, some caveats, you know, it's a small uh, pilot study in terms of the sample size, uh, but it is a good proof of principle showing that in carefully selected patients that are, you know, treated by experienced operators, uh, that this really does provide benefit in terms of blood pressure control beyond what just a sham procedure could do. Yeah, I really, I, I was really a naysayer after the report of the first sham related trial, but this, uh, this extended look gives me some confidence. There will be an occasional patient where either because their blood pressure is just too hard to control or they just don't seem to be able to tolerate some of the medications that we normally would use, this technology may have value. Pyle, do you want to make any comments before we move on? I would echo what you said, Kim, which is that I really have not referred a lot of patients for sympathetic denervation, partly because I was concerned about regeneration of neurons and loss of effect over time. So having this longitudinal data to me does provide some reassurance that for the right patient who perhaps is resistant or non-compliant, this may be a good option. Great. Let's have you then, Pyle, take this next trial called Impulse. So Mpulse is a trial of empagliflozin, which is SGLT2 inhibitor. And we've already seen all the data, of course, with SGLT2 inhibitors, particularly this one, and positive cardiovascular outcomes and reduction in MACE and reduction in heart failure events. But this really looks at a different piece of what heart failure patients go through, which is symptoms, quality of life, physical limitations, and social limitations. And, and it asks the question of whether there's a difference based on your baseline quality of life and functional impairment, how you respond to empagliflozin. So this was a, a randomized control trial of acute heart failure. So you get into the hospital with heart failure, and this is HEFREF and HEFPEF patients uh, with or without diabetes, randomized to empagliflozin 10 milligrams once a day, or placebo within five days of their index hospitalization. And really what they saw was that regardless of what your baseline level of functioning was, which your quality of life was based on the Kansas City cardiomyopathy questionnaire, you had improvement with empagliflozin across the board. And that means all dimensions, including your functional status, your social status, um, even your, your symptoms, um, and of course the quality of life. And this benefit was seen as early as 15 days and really lasted all the way through 90 days. So again, to me, what it tells me is that not only am I starting this medication in the hospital in order to improve these patients' cardiovascular outcomes, but I'm doing it to make them feel better, to make them more social, more functional, functional and have them have a better quality of life. Yeah, I really applaud the investigators for these sub-studies and the big trials that don't just look at hospitalization, but how do I feel today? How do I function this week, next week, the following week? Uh, and this is a very important sub-study. Uh, Deepak, any comments about Impulse? Uh, it's a terrific trial, great data that was presented here. And I think really just adds to this overwhelming mountain of data supporting use of SGLT2 inhibitors, I would say for sure in patients with heart failure, better to start early rather than late, benefits extending across heart failure with reduced with preserved ejection fraction, and even in those patients without diabetes uh, who have heart failure or chronic kidney disease, and for patients with diabetes, really benefits across the full spectrum. So, you know, to me, I, I think we're going to see really an explosion in the use of this class of medications, not just by cardiologists, but by endocrinologists, nephrologists, primary care physicians. Dr. Brownwald recently wrote about SGLT2 inhibitors being the statins of the 21st century, uh, not with respect to mechanism of action, but just in terms of ultimate prevalence of use, especially once these drugs go generic in a few years. I, I think they will be used almost as commonly as statins. I think you're right. Uh the last trial we wanted to talk about today has a great name also called Fidelity. Deepak? Sure. So this is a trial. Actually, it's a pre-specified pooled analysis, patient-level pooled analysis of Fidelio DKD and Figaro DKD, two trials of patients with diabetes and chronic kidney disease studying the non-steroidal MRA or mineral corticoid receptor antagonist known as phenerinone. So that's what fidelity is. And the authors had previously described beneficial effects on cardiovascular outcomes. What was incremental and new and valuable information at this meeting was examining those patients with a history of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease and those patients without a history of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. And for the endpoint of cardiovascular death, non-fatal MI, non-fatal stroke, or hospitalization for heart failure, there was a consistent benefit in each of those subgroups. So to me, that's a really good message. 
Uh, beyond that aspect, obviously, they also looked at safety. Hyperkalemia is increased with, with finerenone, but the data showed uh, or that they presented showed that the clinical impact of that was, was relatively minimal. So obviously, you still need to be aware of that and, and, and cautious about it. But you know, hopefully, it won't be a situation where a generation ago, spironolactone was sort of tarnished with this um, hyperkalemia story that led to vast underuse. Uh, hopefully, history won't repeat itself here because the data do look good. Yeah, we, we really were so fortunate in cardiovascular medicine to have these types of trials, new agents coming along that really are game changers for our patients and for the SGLT2 and, and this class of compounds across the spectrum of risk, we're seeing a benefit which really allows us to approach these patients with confidence. Pyle, any comments about fidelity? Uh, no, actually, I would just echo everything that was already said, but particularly, I was interested to see that there was no worse kidney outcomes uh, in the patients with ASCVD using finerenone. So to me, that was very reassuring, even though it's a higher risk phenotype patient population, obviously, they have higher MACE outcomes, but the use of this novel non-steroidal MRA seemed to be very safe and well-tolerated. Terrific. Well, there you have it. Poise, spiral, impulse, fidelity. Four great names, four great trials that we brought to you today, day three of the ACC 22 meeting. Uh, Pyle and Deepak and I have enjoyed uh, bringing the trial results to you and the highlights. Hope your meeting is great and that your uh, travel home is safe. This is Kim Eagle for ACC.org, and we're out. <music> <laughs>